745 Heavy is on the ILS, 25 left, slow, I know, 185 Heavy, LA, turn on my 25 left, turn on number 2, following Tempting Heavy, Airbus 3, a mile farm. Okay, number 2. What's going on guys, Flyby Simulations here, and welcome to the third episode in my Aircraft's Dissected series, where we delve into every switch, knob, and display in the cockpit of the Zebo Mod Boeing 737-800. In the first video of the series, we covered the forward overhead panels, and in the episode just prior to this one, we covered the aft overhead panel, the central pedestal, as well as the main throttle quadrant in the flight deck, so go check those episodes out first if you haven't already seen them. In this episode, we're going to be taking a look at the main displays and switches that are located right in front of the pilots during normal operations. Specifically, this outboard display unit with the PFD or primary flight display, as well as this top row of switches on the EFIS panel. Lastly, here's the list of things pointed out to me which were partially incorrect explanations that I made in the previous video. You can pause the video and take a look at those if you're interested. So without further ado, let's jump into the flight deck and start our exploration of the forward panels. Alright ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the flight deck of the Boeing 737-800. So as stated, in this video we're going to be taking a look at a few buttons on this EFIS panel as well as the primary flight display over here. Now one final thing I would like to tell you before getting started is that the Zebo Mod 737 doesn't have pop-up displays. The reason I'm saying this is because unlike the other panels we have looked at so far, all of the changes on this display take place when certain buttons and knobs are manipulated on these panels. So it might be a little hard to show me turning a knob here and its corresponding effect on this display here in perfect sync. That being said, I will use the red borders as I have been doing up to this point to make my points as clear as possible. So to start off, let's take a look at this panel here which is called the outboard display unit. Now I've heard many people confusing this panel for the primary flight display or PFD, but that is actually incorrect as this panel itself is called the outboard display unit and what is normally displayed inside this panel is what is called the primary flight display. Why am I mentioning this? You'll come to find out later in the series as we cover a few buttons located in front of the pilots, so stay tuned for that. Anyway, the primary flight display is responsible for showing all of the critical flight information to the pilots, such as the airspeed, altitude, attitude, as well as different autopilot modes enunciated on a few panels here. There are two of these panels on either side, for the captain and first officer respectively. Now, it's important to mention that this display often changes slightly depending on the phase of flight. For example, during takeoff, the takeoff speeds would be indicated on the speed tape over here, whereas during landing, different autopilot modes will be shown on these parts of the PFD. However, for this video, we will specifically be taking a look at the PFD when the aircraft is traveling from San Francisco to New York and climbing to its cruising altitude of 33,000 feet, or flight level 330. In doing so, I will be able to show you many different autopilot modes on this MCP panel and how they affect the PFD in future videos of this series. However, when we do a full flight with the Zebo from point A to point B, you will see all the different elements of the PFD in full detail. So, let's get started and see what sort of information we have here. Okay, so starting off at the top, we have the Flight Mode Annunciator, which displays three important autopilot modes in these three distinct columns. These modes all change throughout the flight depending on the phase of flight, and we will see some of these changes when we manipulate certain knobs and buttons on this MCP panel coming in future videos. Starting off, the first column represents the Auto Throttle System, which tells pilots the specific mode that the Auto Throttle System is working in. Remember from episode 2 that the auto throttle system is part of the greater flight management system in the aircraft, which, along with the overall autopilot system, manages the aircraft's speed, altitude, as well as vertical speed. It currently reads N1, which is an auto throttle mode that manages the speed of the aircraft by controlling the rotational speed of the engine blades. More on that later. Coming to the right, this column represents the roll mode of the aircraft, which controls the directional characteristics of the aircraft during flight. Currently, it reads LNAV, which stands for Lateral Navigation. This is another autopilot mode wherein the autopilot systems are automatically flying the aircraft on the specified route programmed into this FMC, or Flight Management Computer, before takeoff. Finally, this column over here represents the pitch mode of the aircraft, which controls things such as the rate at which the aircraft climbs or descends, and other such indications. 
It currently reads VNAV speed, which stands for Vertical Navigation Speed, allowing the aircraft to maintain a specific speed during cruise or when climbing or descending. Alright, so coming over to the left here, we have the speed tape indicator, which as you probably guessed, displays the indicated airspeed of the aircraft in knots right in the middle. However, it also houses some other important information. Right on top, this pink indicator is the selected airspeed that the autopilot and auto throttle systems in the aircraft are constantly trying to achieve. This speed is normally governed by the flight management computers based on different speed and altitude constraints along the specified route but can also be configured manually on the MCP panel here depending on the phase of flight. You'll see what we mean when we take a look at it in the episode covering the MCP panel specifically. Additionally, this little pink bug represents this very same selected speed visually on the tape, just as an added bonus. Finally, down here, this is the same indicated airspeed but in a Mach number instead of knots. For those of you who don't know, Mach number represents the ratio by which the speed of a moving object may be compared to the speed of sound. The speed of sound has a Mach number of 1, so this number is essentially the speed of the aircraft as a percentage of the speed of sound. Additionally, this display only becomes active once the aircraft gets to Mach 0.4. Coming to the middle, of course, we have the attitude indicator, which displays an artificial horizon along with a bank angle indicator at the top, thereby allowing pilots to see if the aircraft is pitching or rolling to either side during poor visibility conditions such as dense fog. So the artificial horizon, as you can see, has this blue portion which represents the sky and this brown portion which represents the ground. This middle portion represents the horizon. These lines over here indicate 2.5 degree pitch increments by which the aircraft is either pointed up, down, or is level with the horizon. In the middle of the attitude indicator, we have this wing and fuselage indicator, which represents the position of the wings, and this little white square in the middle represents the nose of the aircraft to be able to see its current pitch. Also in the middle, we have these pink crosshairs, which are the flight director bars. These bars are activated on the mode control panel and are required to be on for the autopilot systems to work, as they visually show the aircraft's desired pitch and roll axis at any time. At the very top left, we have this scale ID enunciator, which currently reads LNAV slash VNAV, thereby implying that these autopilot modes are currently active and are flying the plane. The specific scale ID selected on this enunciator also controls these scales on the bottom and right of the artificial horizon, which show how well the aircraft is flying when compared to its programmed route. Note that the scale ID enunciator will also change depending on the phase of flight. For example, during an ILS landing, you will see the localizer and glide slope indications here instead, and will see the two diamonds on the bottom and right of the artificial horizon, allowing pilots to land the aircraft. In the top middle here, this is known as the autopilot status indicator, which is the main indicator on this display to see if the autopilot is in control of the aircraft or not. When displaying CMD, it means that the autopilot systems in the aircraft are in command of all of the flight characteristics of the aircraft. Finally, at the bottom of this display is a warning section, which only comes on when there's a serious imminent threat or danger to the aircraft. Normally, you'll either see a wind shear alert or a pull-up command if you're getting too close to the ground or nearby terrain. Take a look for yourself and pray this never happens to you. Pull up. Wind shear. Wind shear. Wind shear. Terrain. Terrain. Pull up. Obstacle. Obstacle. Pull up. Airspeed low. Finally, moving to the right side of this display, we have the main altitude tape, which, you guessed it, represents the altitude of the aircraft. Now, just like the speed tape on the left, this indication over here represents the current altitude of the aircraft, whereas this pink altitude on top represents the selected altitude that the autopilot systems in the aircraft are trying to achieve, and can be governed either by the FMS or by the pilots on the MCP. On the right of this altitude display, we have a vertical speed display, which simply displays the rate at which the aircraft is climbing or descending in feet per minute, as you can see here. Finally, underneath here, we have the barometric pressure setting that the pilots have selected. We will come to this in a second when we look at the various buttons on the EFIS panel. 
All right, so coming to the very bottom, we have a partial view of the heading indicator, where this white triangular arrow represents the heading that the aircraft is currently facing, and this pink bug over here represents the selected heading on either the FMS or selected by the pilots on the MCP. This number over here is the actual numerical heading of the aircraft, and this mag indicator over here simply means that the aircraft is currently flying relative to magnetic north. Note that the setting can be changed to follow true north instead, if that is required, and we'll take a look at how to do that in future episodes of this series. Okay, and that ladies and gentlemen covers the primary flight display's main components. Next up, we're going to be taking a look at this EFIS panel, which houses some important buttons that change some of the indicators and displays on this PFD. These include everything from the barometric pressure setting we just spoke about, as well as some other helpful assets for the pilots during non-normal conditions. Okay, so coming to this part of the flight deck, as mentioned before, we have the EFIS panel, which stands for the Electronic Flight Information System. Now, just like the PFD, there are two on each side, allowing both the captain as well as the first officer to adjust their own screens as per their own liking. Now, we will only be covering these two knobs and these two buttons in this video, as these are the only ones that directly affect the primary flight display that we just looked at. The rest of these switches below all affect the navigation display, or ND, which we will be taking a look at in the next video of this series. So, starting from this knob on the left here, this is the minimum selector knob, which allows pilots to select the minimum decision height for approach and landing. The premise behind this is that during normal weather conditions, pilots normally have the runway in sight anywhere between 5 and 15 nautical miles away. However, during extreme weather conditions, such as very low cloud ceilings or dense fog, this aircraft has an auto land feature, which allows the aircraft to automatically land without any input from the pilots. However, even during these landings, it is imperative to have the runway in sight after descending to a specified altitude, as any problems with the alignment of the aircraft using the auto land feature needs to be cross-checked by the pilots visually, and enough time needs to be given to them to perform a go-around. More information about that in the previous episode of this series. Hence, during the approach phase of the flight, pilots would normally dial in the specific radio or barometric decision height into this panel. Therefore, when the aircraft descends past this altitude, it sounds an automated voice in the cockpit enunciating minimums, where the pilots can then decide if they are landing or performing a go-around. Hence, the minimums point in a landing is extremely critical. The larger knob on the selector allows you to select between the radial altimeter height or a barometric altimeter height. To keep it simple, the radial altimeter height is simply the height of the aircraft over the specific terrain it is flying over and is therefore much more useful at lower altitudes. The barometric altimeter height is the altitude of the aircraft above mean sea level. The smaller knob on the selector simply allows you to scroll and set the specific height settings for both the radial and barometric modes, depending on what is selected. This middle reset button simply resets the specific minimums mode setting back to zero. Also, if you're wondering how to find these published altitudes or heights, they're again seen on runway charts that all pilots have access to. We will be taking a closer look at these charts when planning for arrival at our destination airport in the Zebo 737 full flight video in this series, coming out shortly. Moving over to the right, this FPV switch stands for Flight Path Vector, which creates this little visual indicator on top of the artificial horizon in the PFD to show if the aircraft is drifting from its specified course in any way. This other button right next to the FPV is the Meters button, which allows the pilots to view their altitude on the PFD in feet as well as meters. This is primarily because some airports in the world offer clearances and other altitude constraints in meters instead of feet, so pilots can use this button to cross-check their values. Finally, we come to this barometric pressure selection knob, which adjusts this part of the PFD we briefly spoke about earlier. Now, before we jump into what this knob does, let's first understand what barometric pressure is, and more specifically, what an altimeter setting is. In simple terms, the pressure altimeter in the aircraft simply indicates the specific elevation of the aircraft above a specified defined point. This defined point is an altimeter subscale, kind of like a reference point for the barometers. When at a mean sea level of zero, the atmospheric pressure anywhere in the world will be 1013 millibars or hectopascals, which is the SI unit for the barometric pressure. 
This can also be measured in inches of mercury, and the equivalent to 1013 hectopascals would be 2992 inches of mercury. You would often use this measurement over the standard SI unit when flying in North America. Hence, depending on the field elevation and weather conditions such as temperature at the local airport, this pressure changes, and air traffic control will often update this so that the aircrafts near the vicinity of the airport have the most accurate altitude readouts that they can get. However, once the aircrafts leave the vicinity of the local airport vertically, meaning that they climb up to a certain altitude, then they can switch the altimeter setting back to the standard subscale pressure, which, as mentioned before, is 1013 hectopascals, or 2992 inches of mercury. This is to then put them in sync with other aircrafts flying around at high altitudes. The specific altitude that aircrafts must reach before switching to local barometric pressure when arriving at the airport and switching to standard barometric pressure when departing from the airport is called the transition altitude. Any altitude above this transition altitude is referred to as a flight level, whereas any altitude below this transition altitude is referred to in feet. For example, throughout the US, the transition altitude is 18,000 feet. So if an aircraft is instructed by ATC to climb to this point on screen, they would say it as climb to 16,000 feet. However, if the aircraft is to, is to climb to this altitude on screen, they would be told to climb to flight level 330, implying that it is 33,000 feet above mean sea level. So coming back to this selector, this larger knob allows you to switch between displaying the pressure in hectopascals or inches of mercury, whereas the smaller selector allows you to select the specific barometric pressure setting. This middle standard button allows you to switch between the local and standard barometric pressure when passing the transition altitude. All of these changes are of course reflected on the primary flight display, as was the case with the minimum selector knob. Once again, I will be leaving comprehensive documentation down in the description if you guys want more information about these systems. So ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the end of this aircraft's dissected episode, covering the primary flight display and the top of the EFIS panel. Now if you guys are wondering why this episode was so short, you guys in the community have been giving me some amazing feedback, but the general highlights have been that I need to talk a tad bit slower and you guys appreciate shorter videos. So, in order to maintain the same level of quality that you guys have come to expect from my content while also talking slower and keeping the video length short, the only way for me to achieve all of those things is to divide these videos into bite-sized bits. Let me know in the comment section if this sort of length is okay for you or if you would like me to tweak anything else about the commentary. That being said, the next episode in the series will focus on the navigation display or ND as well as the rest of the buttons on the EFIS panel as mentioned before. If you guys enjoyed the video, make sure to fly by the comment section and let me know if there's any questions you'd like me to answer for you. Make sure to perform a full stop landing at the like button and the subscribe button if you enjoyed the content and press the bell icon for future notifications from this channel. And as usual, thanks for flying by.